how did you decide to go to Idaho for college? Had a um, chance to go to Washington State, the University of Washington, and a couple of other schools. And my dad had a business in Sandpoint, Idaho. And some of the business people were encouraging him to have me go to the University of Idaho. And I was actually at the University of Washington, and the coach took me out on the field and introduced me in the middle of a scrimmage and took me to dinner, and they had a boat that wanted to take me fishing up the west coast there of Canada and Washington and said they'd uh, fly my folks to every home game for three years. So I called my dad and I don't need to fly to a home game. If I need to go to a game, I can drive. You get home, you're going to Idaho. So I started thinking about it and well, if I go to Idaho, I'll probably play a lot. And the better I play, the, the better I'll get. And the more I play, the better I'll get. And so maybe I can play that other game uh, after a while. So we were playing. Idaho was playing Oregon, Oregon State, Washington, Washington State at that time. So it was a, you know, pretty good schedule. And so we were competing against some really good schools. So I decided I would go to Idaho and keep peace in the family. And, you know, in the little town of Sandpoint. Who was the watching coach? Because that was before Jim Owen was there for so long. I think it was Johnny Sherberg. So what was it like to play at Idaho? Well, you know, it was it was fantasy land for me, David. It was uh, going to college was uh, not on my radar uh, through high school, and then all of a sudden it uh, jumped up in the form of scholarships. No one had gone to school in my sixth my six of us, the family, six children. And my older brother got married and went to work and older sister got married and then nobody had gone to college. So it was um, quite an experience for me. And I um, joined a fraternity and became a Sigma Nu, which was a, another whole level of college that was something that was unknown to me. And so it was a wonderful experience. I was, uh, I had a great time in college. I just loved it. It was great pals, uh, both on the football team and the fraternity. Uh, kids that uh, were lifelong pals. And uh, everybody was, you know, youth and optimistic and full of fun. And it was a wonderful time. I I really enjoyed college, and uh, the games were, you know, kind of long and arduous. And we would average you know, 59 minutes a game, and then we'd be out for five or six minutes the last game of the season, and that would make it 59 because we played damn near every snap both ways. Wayne Walker. With my teammate, I had three or four other kids that played. Tony Anderson played professional football with the with uh, the. I can't think now, but the Bears, I think, and Jim Prestel played, and Bobby Dillinger played in Canada, and Jim Norton played in Houston in the American uh, Football League at that time. So there were some pretty good players, but just not very many of them. You played in the college all-star game. What was that like? Well, you know, it was um, Wayne Walker and I played in the East West Shrine 
and I played in the Senior Bowl and in the College All Star Game, and Wayne played in the College All Star Game, and that was a that was really a, a wonderful step between college football and professional football, and because we were playing against Ohio State and Notre Dame and Michigan and West Virginia and kids from all over the country were on our team and uh, as opponents on the field. So it was a huge, huge thing for us. Uh, uh, Maybe one of the biggest things in our life up to that point. Otto Graham was our coach at the college all-star game. And uh, John Sandusky was my line coach and uh, had an interesting uh, deal with John. He told me I wasn't going to make the Green Bay Packers. Why was that? Yeah, he said... uh, You'll be able to play, but you just won't make that Green Bay Packer team. And uh, I looked at him kind of funny. He said, Jerry, I played there last year. They got five veteran guards returning. So I'm going, well, okay. So I go up to Green Bay. <clears throat> Scooter McLean's our head coach. And he says, uh, Calls me into his office. He says, what in the hell is wrong with you? I said, what do you mean, coach? Well, you're looking out at the crowd. You're giggling. You're playing grab ass. You're not watching the scrimmage. You're, you know, you just don't seem to be engaged. Well, I'm waiting to be traded. You're what? Uh, my college uh, all-star coach told me I'd be traded. He said that I wouldn't make this team, so I'm waiting to be traded. Well, I didn't draft you to trade you. You're starting Friday night. So this is, gave me a couple of days to think about it. But it was an interesting uh, final. Uh, we came down to 37 guys on the club, and we were going to keep 36. And there was a, another guard named Kenny Gray, who later played with the Cardinals. Right. And... Um, he and I came down it came down to one of us. And he'd been there the whole camp and he was playing defensive tackle and making himself valuable and he was a good good football player and good guard and I see him the day we I get the news that I'm gonna be a Green Bay Packer, I'm down at the uh, cigar store and magazine picking up some magazines and he's across the street from me when I come out and he hollers across the street. He says, son of a bitch, you had a no-cut contract, didn't you? I goes, what's a no-cut contract? But he uh, was released, and he went to St. Louis and played for 10, 12 years. And you know he wore number 64 down there? <laughs> yeah. Kind of kind of odd, but it was he was a, a good football player. And I believe he was an all pro at one time too. He was a good football player. So the college all star game was uh, a huge thrill. We beat the Detroit Lions and put them on the skids for fifty years or sixty <laughs> or whatever it's been now. And um my pal Wayne Walker never got over it. He uh really had a hard time with my success and his lack of success. And he thought I was lucky, and I was. But uh, college All-Star game was a big big move and a big start. And again, it was, you know, if you can play against these guys, these are the kind of guys that are going into the league, and you can probably play in the league. It was a, it was a defining moment for us in terms of, you know, our confidence. Who was on that college all-star team with you? John David Crow, Manowski, Taylor, um, Joe Nicely from West Virginia, uh, Charles Kruger. We were, um, Charlie Kruger of Texas A&M, and he was about three days late getting into camp and his wife would call about every 15 minutes and she'd say, is Charles Kruger, why y'all? No, ma'am, Charlie's not here. 
it's Charles Kruger, are you? And so he really, literally, day and night, she was calling. And finally he gets there. And so it's for the rest of the camp. It's, it's Charles Kruger, are you? <laughs> We're all messing with him, right? And I write about this in Instant Replay in the 67 season. And uh, in 68, we're playing the San Francisco 49ers in Green Bay, and Charlie is playing defensive tackle against me, right? And uh, I go into this mental thing to prepare for a game. I get angry and generate a manageable, intelligent anger, but it's an anger, and it gets my juices flowing, and it uh, it's kind of like I'll show that son of a, you know, it kind of helped me help me get ready to play. And I didn't want to talk to anybody. Didn't, I didn't want to look at anybody. I didn't want to have any conversations. I just want to work on my mind and my emotions. And um, I'm out on the field and I'm going through all this. I don't look at anybody. And finish our warm ups and we go back in the locker room for the last two or three minutes of pregame conversation and I'm going up the steps and um, I feel this presence right behind me just uh, almost brushing me and his his voice uh, leans up against my ear and it, it says is Gerald Kramer via <laughs> god damn you Charlie he just destroyed he, and he knew it too he read he read it to replay and he knew what I was doing and what I was thinking. And he just destroyed my preparation. But I enjoyed the hell out of him and John David and all the guys. It was just a fun, fun time. Dan Curry was there. Um, Mitch was there. Mm. Taylor. Well, your teammate Walker had to think he had got the better uh, end of the deal by joining the Lions because they're coming off a play for the NFL championship and you're joining the Packers, who were basically almost like the football Siberia, the NFL back then. They weren't winning anything. Exactly. We were. We drove to, back to uh, the college All Star game together. I had a little blue Chevy convertible, baby blue seats and tops, and we um, gave ourselves ten days to get from Boise to Chicago, and seven days out were in West Yellowstone. Um, so we had to kick it in gear, but all the way back, Wayne is going, I'm going to the Detroit Lions, world champion Detroit Lions, I might add, with Joe Schmidt and Zatkoff and Martin and Bobby Lane and Night Train Lane, and you're going to Green Bay. (laughs) And he busted my ass all the way from Boise to Chicago with that noise, right? So he was um, tickled to death to be going to Detroit, and he thought that he was finally... I had got a little more publicity than Wayne and a a little more uh, of the teams, you know, than Wayne, and just a little bit, and he played... He played as much as I did, and he's a hell of a football player. And he had a wonderful career, but he kept comparing it to mine. And he was always, you know, they we won championships, they didn't. So he was always a little feisty with me, a little fussy about uh, Green Bay. And he had a difficult time with it. So uh, it all worked out just fine for me, but... Uh, Wayne had a problem with it. How did the attitude change? And, the, and David, so so did the whole uh, Detroit team. You know, it wasn't just uh, you know. I, I, we we beat them in Green Bay nine to seven early in the I think Lombardi's first or second year on a field goal when he kicked free kick and he kicked it like a fifty yard unobstructed uncharged field goal, and we won the game in the last few seconds. And their quarterback, Milty Plum, had thrown an interception. And they're just going schizo in the in the locker room. They're throwing garbage cans around and breaking shit and just going nuts because they had us. And 
it seemed like that, you know, we got tied one time, but we went to the playoffs seven times or six times and they didn't. And they were in the same division, of course. And so it was, it was, they had good reason to have anger with us. How did uh, it change when Vince Lombardi became your head coach? Everything changed. Um, we were having fun um, before Coach Lombardi arrived. We were just tickled to death to be professional football players. We were drinking beer and hanging out and bullshitting and just enjoying every aspect of it. And we did very little conditioning. We'd kind of wave our arms and make our fingers go up and down. And that's good. Let's go. And uh, our head coach would play gin with Horning and McGee. And um, one of the guys. And we uh, had our celebration in the locker room. We were 1 10 and 1. And after about the fourth loss or so, it got so painful to go downtown that uh, we started going to the locker room. We take the baby and go home and check everything and get the sitter stabilized and come back to the locker room and bring a bottle. And we had a Coke machine, an ice machine, and a jukebox in the jock locker room. So there must have been 20 to 25 couples, and we'd kick the socks and jocks out of the way and dance and have a party and have a few drinks. And we wouldn't go downtown, but we were still having a hell of a good time. But, um, local folks in Green Bay want to know what the hell was going on. Why why Baltimore beat us 56 to nothing. And uh, so uh, then the, the coach laid it out on the first, uh, first meeting. I've never been a loser, and I'm not about to start now. You're not willing to make the sacrifice to pay the price to support your team and do the things you need to do to win and get the hell out. The three things in your life, your God, your family, and the Green Bay Packers. That's it. We're going to work harder than we have ever worked before. There are planes and trains and buses leaving here every day. I have a five-year contract, and some of you may be on them. So he laid it out pretty clearly what uh, the kind of work we're getting. But we didn't believe it, you know, until... We got on the field, and and then people started losing consciousness, which is keel over and uh, and throw water on them and pull them off the side and keep on going. And uh, some Leon Crenshaw uh, went up after practice, went to the shower, showered, got on the bus, went back to the St. Norbert uh, Chow line, the cafeteria, and he's standing in the cafeteria, and he loses consciousness he crumples over and uh it was absolutely um well i had a a scout from st louis on the sidelines by the tower one day and i came out of the scrimmage and he looked at me and he goes jerry i have never seen anything like this i have never seen anybody work like you guys are working he said if we did this in st louis half of the guys would quit the other half would be dead. And so we, you know, remember July. It's come into the late part of the season, and, and somebody would say, remember July. Somebody going to pay. We paid a big price to get here, and somebody going to pay if they're going to beat it. So it was uh, extreme conditioning. And, um, you know, that, the, the the spark in Lombardi was what really made the difference, David. It was we had good football players and um, fast and all the qualifications, all the characteristics necessary to play the game, but we didn't have a fire, we didn't have a burn, we didn't have a direction, we didn't have a, a spark in us, you know. And he put that spark, that fire, that that drive in you. He uh, did it with, you know, he said he coached 40 individual people, not 
a team of 40 people. He coached 40 individuals. He told, you heard the story about him telling me after chewing my ass unmercifully that I was going to be one of the best guards in football. Herb Adderley came off the field one day and he ran up to Herb and said, Herbie, you have just played the finest game I have ever seen the cornerback play. And you take that with you. Whenever you walk on the field in the future, you carry that thought with you. And Herbie said, for the rest of my career, whenever I walked on the field, guess what? So he found out when and where you were most vulnerable. And he would, uh, either pat you on the back or chew your ass or both. But the one thing that was really consistent about him and interesting about him is he never left a practice uh, without reestablishing communications. He, he chewed my ass for jumping off sides, and so uh, he was looking for me. He came up in the locker room looking for me, and, and came down and patted me on the shoulder and reestablished communications. And that was part of the brilliance of him because you, you'd know that, okay, he chewed my ass, but I made a mistake. Maybe I should have had my ass chewed. I'll be a little more focused next time, and maybe I won't make the mistake. And maybe I can, you know, if he thinks I can be really good, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can be something special. Uh, so he was uh, the magic of it all, and it was the emotional package that he brought that uh, he created in each and every one of us that made the difference. You lost, what, what one playoff game <clears throat> your entire career with the Packers? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that will ever be accomplished again? You know, it's with the not under the current rules you know we look for competitive balance today uh, our salary caps our ability to move from team to team uh, so many of the rules now uh, are made to create an even field for everybody uh, obviously we've got eight or ten teams that seem to be in the mix all the time, but the, the, you can't keep an offensive line together for 10 years. Uh, you have to pay them too much and you don't have enough money. And if you're going to pay the quarterback what he deserves or what he can get, then you can't pay them. You got to get a new guard. You better draft one. Cause that one, that eight year old, eight year guy there, he's expensive as hell and we can't afford him. So I, it's, it's more difficult today to be a dynasty. Although New England seems to be um, outside that rule, don't they? They seem to be doing awfully well. But uh, yeah, you know, if 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 you can create that fire, and, and David, I know you are familiar with the fact that a lady can lift a car off a baby. We've seen examples of that or heard about it, read about them. There's something, that last drive in the ice bowl, we get the ball, it was four and a half minutes ago. We're on the 35 yard line. We got 65 yards to go to score. It's minus 57. We're freezing our ass. We haven't made, we've made a minus nine yards in the previous 31 plays. Bart gets in the huddle and says, all right, let's go. That's all he said. And the emotion, the, the generation of emotion, the, the drive, the hunger, the want, the burn, the fire, whatever the <coughs> hell you want to call it, kicked in, and everybody on that team felt it and made a contribution, and we'd go down the field and score and win with 13 seconds to go. So that emotional package you can get a guy with legs, you can get a guy with size, you can get a guy with speed, give me a guy with heart. I looked at Ron Kostelnik when he joined us, oh golly, my third or fourth year, and he had a little bit of a Dunlap 
coming over his belt, and he was not well defined. He looked chubby rather than muscular. And uh, I'm looking at him, and I go, boy, this this kid is not going to be here long. Well, he only started nine years for us. <laughs> but I couldn't measure his heart, David. I couldn't measure his want. I couldn't measure his fire. And uh, if you can capture that and create that team, that love and care for the team. You know, we didn't, we played, I played with broken ribs for the team, not for the money, not for the coach, for the guys. I played with 103 fever, busted thumb, odds and ends, concussions, detached retinas, all kinds of shit. But I didn't play for a coach. I played for the guys. Bart Starr never put up, like, crazy numbers, but it just seemed like he was a leader. What made him so great? Leader. Well, Bart was a, uh, he had a, there was a singular moment in Bart Starr's career that changed our opinion of him, and I believe it changed his life. We're playing the Bears. Nasty Bears was a nasty middle linebacker. And uh, Coach had told Bart to throw the ball deep. He was he'd throw it underneath, and the safeties were coming up, and they were threatening to intercept. And so he said, just throw the damn thing as far as you can throw it. I don't care if you complete it or not. Just throw it down the field. So we got a pass play, and Bart uh, – goes back to throw and my defensive tackle uh, Bart throws and my tackle stops and turns around and watches the ball I'm watching the ball Bill George our middle linebacker is not watching the ball Bart's watching the ball Bill's coming and uh, Bill takes about a five yard run and hits Bart with a forearm right square in the mouth and knocks him backward about five yards and says, that ought to take care of you, Star, you pussy. And Bart Starr said, fuck you, Bill George. We're coming after you. And Bart was bleeding. His, his upper lip was split up into his nose, all the way up into his nose. And, and he was bleeding just immediately, just flowing down the front of his jersey. And I said, Bart, you better get uh, sewed up. You better go to the sideline and get sewed up. He said, shut up and get in the huddle. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Starr. And he took us down the field eight or nine plays to a score. And then he went to the sidelines like the rest of us. And he got, they laid him down on the bench. We weren't as delicate as these young boys today, but they took about 11 stitches in his upper lip and uh, he, he went back in the game the next time we got the ball. He never missed a play. So the only question really about Bart up to that point was his toughness and could he stand it? Could he take it? Could, could, was he tough enough to play? And that answered that question very loudly and very completely. And for the rest of his career there, I never doubted Bart Starr. And he became our leader, I think, that day. I remember many times I would I would think I had a play that might work. And uh, I talked to Bart about it one time. And he said, well, Jerry, talk to the other guys, see what they have to say. Do they think it'll work? And so from that point on, I would go to Ringo or Bo, and I'd go to Fuzz and Forrest and Ski or Gilly or whoever the hell was in the game, and I said, it looks to me like this play would work for us. It looks good from my standpoint. What do you think? Yeah, Jerry, I think it'll work. Yeah, Jerry, I think it'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I go to Bart, and I say, everybody thinks it will work. So if you need it, this play is available. But uh, he just uh, showed that that steel in him, that that fire, and uh, and he was bright, and um, he did things that I don't think people often do. We're playing the Bears again one time, David. We have a cadence when we get to the line of scrimmage is set, 
a single-digit number and a double-digit number in a series of huts, as in 248, hut, hut, hut. And if the if this quarterback repeats the snap count, say, it, say he, it's on two, and he comes up to the line of scrimmage and he says two, then it's a brand-new play. And the next double-digit number is the play, and it goes on the second hut. So we call this play on one, and Bart comes up to the line of scrimmage, and break the huddle and come up to the line of scrimmage, and he said, sit, two, 46, and the whole bear defense moves, shifts over to our, our right, their left, kills the play, just overwhelms the play, got no shot, and yet the next thing I should hear is hot. And he called it on one, actually. And he comes up and says 247, so it's supposed to go on hut, on the first hut. And the play is dead, dead, dead. And I'm going, Jesus, I got this. I, and if I hear a hut, I got to block this 280-pound idiot across the line of scrimmage from me. Or if he changes it, I may have to pull left. And uh, it's bad to be in that state. It's kind of a, it's a tough to anticipate and tough to get a good start and tough to do everything. But he goes, easy, pull it, one, 36, cut. And there wasn't a missed assignment. There wasn't a single guy that was out of focus that didn't understand where the hell we were and waiting on him to change the play. And so he knew that, and he knew his game, and he knew our game, and he was just a a bright, uh, intelligent human being, and he is tough as nails. like, Like Zeke said one time, you may think Bart's a sweetheart, but he'll cut your heart out if he has to. How did the offensive line feel when Jim Taylor led the league in rushing, breaking Jim Brown's streak? Because, I mean, no one could run like Jim Brown back at that time. Well, well you know, we we really uh, were a, a, a team, and we wanted the team to win, and individual accomplishments weren't uh, – made that big a deal out of we we would we would have a game against Cleveland and everybody knew that Jim Brown was having a war with Taylor and Taylor was having a war with Jim Brown so we we may have played a little extra or gave it a little more but we didn't have a lot extra to give we were playing with everything we had and we were happy when Jimmy came out ahead and we thought that reflected on us, so we were proud. And uh, we often did that. And, and there was always a, a feeling of we our, our running game, you know, was our bread and butter pretty much. And um, the passes were mixed in to <laughs> confuse them as to when we were running most of the time. So Taylor and Horning were... Um, different runners. Jimmy was more brutal, uh, brute force. Horning was more cerebral. Horning uh, would see a, a, a defensive back and he'd know that I had to block that defensive back and he would <clears throat> be under control enough to get at the magic point where the defensive back has got to make a decision. If he doesn't, I'm going to kill him. He, so he is in a position where he's got to move. And at that instant, Horning will take a step to his left and make his shoulders and his whole body go that way like he's going that way. And the defensive back commits and comes in to make the tackle or to, to meet me. And then Horning sets me up for a block and he goes the other way. So they were different runners, but both of them were sensational. And we were always, in, you know, we, if they got 100 yards a game, we were happy, each of them. So it was always a, more of a team thing than an individual thing. But we sure as hell remembered it and we're aware of it. And 
we were happy about it. Was there any competition between um, Taylor and Hornick where they wanted to be the star and get the ball versus the other one? Yeah, I, I, it, it never came. It was never out in the open, but I think there was. I think uh, uh, there was a little jealousy or a little emotional something there. Uh, Paul made plenty of fun to Jimmy uh, at from time to time with just um, set him in a, in a situation and Jimmy Jimmy wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, Paul would say something like pretty much every time Jimmy and uh, Jimmy would say well I didn't say that he wouldn't he wouldn't say that he didn't know what the hell Paul was saying and so he uh, made himself look silly right about half right. the time but the the normal team attitude was Fuzzy and Gilly. Uh Gilly took Fuzzy's job uh a couple of years before we left and uh Fuzzy sat by Gilly and coached him and in the meetings and he was coaching him on the field and he was help he said, Gilly, the guy you you play is so and so, and he likes a bull rush to the inside, or he likes to dance a little first, and then he comes. And Fuzzy coached him just like a, a regular coach. Doug Hart lost his job to um, Jeet, Bob Jeter. So Doug coached Jeter, sat beside him and coached him, gave him every, everything he had, all the information he had. And that was what the normal guy did uh, on the team. But there were there were a few little uh, rivalries there, and Paul and Jimmy were. I think they were, you know, they were both sensational players. They blocked for each other. They, they. Uh, that's one of the I think best uh, ways of measuring it is they had to block the defensive end on the sweep. You know, when Paul was carrying the ball, Jimmy had to block, and when Jimmy's carrying the ball, Paul had to block. And they took care of their job. They did their business, and they didn't let whatever it might be, if there was some uh, animosity or anything between them, they did not let it affect the play. Who was the toughest defensive lineman you faced? Yeah, you know, actually, there's about five of them that uh, I remember very well. Um, Leo Namalini. Um, great football player from San Francisco. Leo helped me out a great deal by putting his right foot back when he was going inside on the 4-3 defense, and he put his feet parallel when he went outside. So I picked that up my first year against him, and from that point on, I knew everything Leo was going to do as soon as he knew it. And it made a huge difference in my blocking. Uh, Artie Donovan was a shaker and a, a matador. Uh, he, he, most big defensive tackles will come straight at you and bully you and try to run over you or take you back to the quarterback. They'll use strength on you and they'll use aggression. Artie would stand up and shake. He would just get his big fat belly going side to side, and he'd wait for you to make a, a lunge at him. And then he would step aside or grab you and push you in the direction you want to go, and then he would go around you. And you, you, it, it, I didn't understand that those kind of tackles played in the NFL. And the first time I played against him, I wanted to hit him after the game and make sure he was real. <laughs> but he uh, he was uh, an education. You know, all you had to do with him really was wait on him. And if you finally figured that out, then he couldn't shake forever. He got to make a move, and when he makes his move, that's when you move. But you got to have the patience. So Charlie Kruger, and fellow I mentioned from San Francisco, is a Boy from Texas, about 6'5", 265, lean, just brought it all day and all night. He just never really slowed down for a play. He didn't take a half a play off. He didn't take a quarter of a play off. He just 
never let up. And uh, top two in my book were Merlin and Alex, and they were both pretty close. Uh, Merlin had great work ethic, great uh, physical capabilities, 6'5". I got Merlin and Doug Atkins on the scale one day at the Pro Bowl. Uh, they're giving me some crap about something. I said, you fat asses, get over here. I want to see what you weigh. And they both got on the scales for me, and one weighed 296, and one weighed 300. Now, they're both listed about 265. But that was a long way from reality. So Alex uh, had the the emotional... Merlin never quit either. Merlin was gonna gonna be there till tomorrow night. If you if you played, you better you're gonna try to whoop him. You better bring a light and a lunch because it's gonna take a while. And um, Alex was emotional against us. I remember I was a finalist for the '97 uh, Hall and. Uh, I remember Art uh, Daly calling me and doing a story, and and I said, well, Alex didn't play his heart out against Atlanta or the crappy teams. You know, he played his heart out against Green Bay, and he was fiery in Green Bay, and he was emotional, and he played his ass off, and he's a hell of a football player. And Art hung up from me and called Alex in the next two seconds, right? And he said, Kramer said uh, he didn't maybe uh, play all that hard against Atlanta and some of the lesser teams and that you had a lot of animosity toward Green Bay and a lot of passion, a lot of fire. You're a different player. And Alex says, I'd say he's about right. (laughs) So so he was a he was a wonderful football player. Also, Alex had that low center of gravity. You know, Merlin was six five, big old tall boys got this strength up above. Alex was like I don't think he was under six foot, but he was felt like he was like five ten and the two eighty five, you know. And he just had a low center of gravity and it was really strong. Uh, worked out all the time as a professional wrestler, his background and all that stuff. So, and he had the fire and had the burn. And he was a hell of a player. That iconic picture of you in the ice bowl with Bart Stark going behind you. Did they, how did they make you feel knowing that Bart trusted you to get him in the end zone? Well, you know, I was, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't think about that at the time. Uh, I had suggested that play. It was one of my, you know, things that uh, we did. Uh, I watched three films of the Cowboys, their three previous games to our game. And the first game, I see Jeff Rose High. He, uh, Bob Lilly, they have a, a defense, a goal line defense. They put their noses about, 10 or 12 inches from the field and Lily charges straight ahead and low and you can't move him with a D9 cap. He's just coming. Jethro comes up and he's supposed to stay down too. So I watched that in one game and we'll, we'll see. In the next game it's the same. In the next game it's the same. So I, I mentioned to Coach Lombardi and said, Coach, we can wedge fuel if we have to. And in his most con- conversational, social uh, voice, he says, what? I said, I, 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 I think we can let you if we have to. Run that back. So I run it back about four times, and he says, that's right, put in the wedge on cue. So I, okay, I just saw something, and it was no dreams of it being on the one-yard line with 15 seconds to go. Uh, in the middle of the field, maybe, second quarter, maybe, you know. Uh, maybe we don't use it at all. Maybe we don't need it. So, I, I, you know, I didn't think a lot about it. And uh, when we get to the that situation, and the, we had 
Boy Dowler had played so well. Donnie Anderson had played so well. Chuck Mercine had given his heart, right? And they all elevated their performance. And Gilly and Forrest and Ski and Bobo and everybody was playing. We were a different team when we came down that field on that drive. And so now it's my turn and it's my responsibility. And I know where I am and what I need to do. And I just pray that Jethro is going to do what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to come up like he has the last three weeks. So I find a little divot, almost like a golf divot, where my left foot would go. Normally I drive off my right foot, my right foot's back, and I get more push off my right foot. But uh, my shoe, my left shoe just snuggled into that divot and it gave me like a starting block. And so I had a, a really good start when it came out of there. And I, I just, you know, I'm in difficult situations. There are two things you really need to do. Keep your head up, your eyes open, follow through. That's three. But that's all I thought about is, uh, it's your it's your responsibility. If you've suggested the play, you it's on your back now. So let's get the job done. So I kept my eyes open, and Jethro came up, and I put my face in his chest, and done it, done it, done it, done it. Everything worked out. Who was Lombardi's biggest rival? Was it the Bears, or was it Tom Landry and the Cowboys, since they were both assistants with the Giants? Now, I, I, you know, he he was uh, he knew that the the fans considered the Bears the ultimate rival, and he would he would say things. I want you to go out there and beat those Bears. I want you to tear them up today. You guys beat the Bears. I'll kick old man Hallis's ass. <laughs> and then he would giggle a little bit. And uh, but we would have practice on Tuesday and Wednesday or Wednesday and Thursday, not Tuesday so much, but Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, we would wear different jerseys when it was bear week. Like I might wear number 12 and Bart might wear number 75. And um, coach would say, who is that lineman down there? That's one of Hallis' spies. Go see who is. Go get his ID. See who it is. And he was always using little gimmicks to get us interested in the game and pumped up about it and something different. So it was, you look back on it, David, and it was so silly. that. And, and could you imagine the Bear Scout coming to Coach Hallis and saying, they got Forrest Gregg playing quarterback. <laughs> Number 75 is the quarterback this week. <laughs> Not likely. You know, but but it kind of got us going, and it gave us a little lift and a little boost and a little more animosity toward the Bears. But I think I think probably the Cowboys were more personal. He and Landry didn't always agree on things in New York, and that '58 game where Lombardi wanted to go for it and Landry wanted to punt, so. There was always a, a a personal thing there with Landry, I believe. When you wrote the book, Instant Replay, how did your teammates feel about the book and other players in the league? Generally, I think it was pretty positive. I uh, We were in training camp. The book had come out in, uh, just a little week or two before training camp, but we're in training camp, and uh, the book's getting a lot of conversation. and. I have a record that I like to play uh, before I go to sleep or as I'm going to sleep. It was called One Stormy Night, and it was thunder and uh, rain and pitter-patter and just mood music kind of. And I'm saying that, and Gail Gillingham and Forrest Gregg are right across the hallway from me at St. Norbert. So... I hear some stirring, stirring, stirring around over there, and Gilly had got a glass, and he's gone.
went down to the john and he came in our room and he threw the water up on the ceiling and so it was really raining and he's giggling his ass off and Forrest is giggling his ass off they think it's really funny and Don Chandler I think is no maybe Willie my roommate that year but anyway we don't think it's quite as funny as they do and I think uh, Willie said uh, be careful Forrest Jerry will put that in his next book and of course, uh, that damn book. That's all I hear about. Everybody wants to know about that book. That damn book. And he says, I'll tell you one thing, Jerry. You were dead honest about it. You were dead honest. And I thought that was as high a praise as I could receive. That my, not only my teammate, but my line mate and my guy who communicated with me like a brother. I mean, we were pretty close together and when I saw something that was different I'd say Forrest got it and when he saw something he said Jerry I'd say yep so that's all we said when you know our situation came up and so I thought that was high praise from Forrest and uh, I think generally the guy has really enjoyed the book and it's, 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 it's been so much more than a book for uh, David. I still get letters and people were inspired by it and they took the Lombardi principles and it worked for them. And I was a young kid, nine years old, and I read the book every year for the last 35, 40 years. And it was a, uh, a surprise to me personally. Uh, I was I was I had a little struggle my own self. I came back from the meeting with the publisher and and uh, all the people that he worked with and Dick and uh, our, our agent and a big meeting in New York and I had asked the publisher. I said, "Now, what's good? How many books do we need to sell to do good?" And he said, oh, Jerry, 7,500 to 10,000. He said, sports books don't sell traditionally. So I think if we do 10,000 books, we'll do well. So I'm going to be an author, right? And I had no dream of ever writing a book or even being close to somebody that wrote a book. But I start to think that I have to get some big, long, flowery words that uh, an author would use and I had better increase my vocabulary and uh, thoughts like that right and that went on for two or three days and then myself said who do you think your shit I mean come on it is what it is and you is what you is so just be as dead honest as you can be about it Tell it exactly the way you you see it and you think it should is or could be, and be precise about what you say because you're going to have to defend it and be ready to to defend it. Be ready for that. So, and if they don't like it, they don't like it. But at least you put it down the way you saw it to be and the way you thought it was. And so that was my my final thought on that. You played offensive line guard. You also kicked. <clears throat> Did you enjoy doing one more than the other? No, no. I, um, I, I, you kicking it puts a little pressure on your booty. It's a little bit of a different deal. You're all alone. There's nobody else doing much. Um, the whole stadium is watching you. Uh, so it's a. Uh, you know, you can't think about all those things. You just got to think about keeping your head down and follow through and hit the ball properly and doing getting everything right. But uh, there's always little nerves with the kicking part of things. And, uh, in a, you know, as an offensive lineman, my mama didn't know what I was doing in there. Nobody would hardly ever see you unless you get an ice bowl block or something like that. But for the big part, you go uh, unnoticed. And that's what you prefer, really, as an offensive lineman, to go unnoticed. And the 
the, the kicking, I, I was, I felt it as a responsibility and not a celebration. I wasn't tickled to death when I made a kick. I was relieved that I had been able to do what the team wanted me to do. And uh, the last kick I made in Yankee Stadium in 62, I knew exactly where we were. And I knew that if I made that kick, it would put the game pretty much out of reach. It would be two scores. And uh, wind blowing like hell. And I aim 10 yards outside the right goal post. And I kick the ball. I hit it pretty solid. And it comes right down into the middle of the goal post. So if I hadn't, and I wasn't thinking about, you know, I knew where we were and I knew the game and I knew that, but this is my responsibility. They're asking me to do something and I got to get it done. So I was more <sighs> relaxed and pleased that I had been able to make, make the kick and I was celebrating about the kick and feeling like, I, you know, was something hoop to do. How much pressure was there in that first Super Bowl playing the Chiefs to win that game? You know, we didn't give the Chiefs as much credit as they deserved. We, we uh, had no information about anybody they'd ever played, so we had nobody to scout. I mean, no way of judging them and their opponents. We watched films, but I know we were watching a film one evening, and two of their safeties ran into each other. Obviously, one of them went the wrong way, but uh, they knocked each other down, just knocked flat on their ass. And Max McGee goes, and he starts doing Merry Moons and Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies, you know, the, the comedy um, song. And um, um, both money or whatever the hell it was, but it, we were giggling, you know, we, we were laughing about it. And uh, we thought that, you know, the actually the games would be uh, in descending order of difficulty that maybe the Rams would be the most difficult since they'd beaten us three weeks before and the Cowboys would be right behind them. They had a good football team, but then we thought if we got to the Super Bowl, that would be the easiest game of the playoffs. And the first quarter, we found out different. We found out that there were some pretty damn good football players on the other side of the line like E.J. Hollop and uh, who was the big tackle, Ernie Ladd. Right. And uh, uh, Bobby Bell, Johnny Robinson. And uh, they had some Willie pretty Lanier. damn good – Willie Lanier, yeah. They had some pretty good football players. So uh, we kind of checked our gear at halftime and buckled their hats and – came out of there with a little bit more of a different attitude and a much more serious attitude and um, took care of business. But uh, we were we were not really that tense or uptight or worried prior to the game. I think we were more worried at halftime than we were at the beginning. You're a finalist again for the Hall of Fame. How much does it mean to make the Hall of Fame? You know, it, it uh, would be a wonderful thing for me and my family and my friends and all the people that are pulling for us. Uh, I'm trying to treat this uh, in a way that I can handle it that are, as a singular event. This is the nomination and the finalist position is a wonderful gift. It's like making an all-time team or an all-star team or something. It's it's really nice. And if I don't get the big nod into Canton and make it all the way, then it's been a great gift. It's been a wonderful thing. It's just been super. And so I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to roll in it and revel in it and, and just have a wonderful time with it. And I'm tickled to death to be 
uh, nominated again, and I thought it was over. You know, I thought I pretty much made peace with myself that that wasn't something that was going to happen for me. And uh, this is just a, a wonderful nod for an old fart, you know, and I've been down the road a bit. And uh, if we go further, then we'll take it at that time and we'll celebrate with everybody. I'll get fuzzy out of his grave and make him celebrate <laughs> with me. 